Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. And we are back with our second interview for today. We are commemorating uh, the 400th year anniversary of 29 Africans coming into Port Comfort in Virginia. We have the legacy of slavery in America, 400 years, 1619 to 2019, the African presence before slavery. And I am joined by another one of my teachers because we just uh, wrapped up with Dr. Leonard Jeffries. And here we are here with Professor James Small. Hotep, brother, how you doing today? What's up, brother Michael? How are you? Oh, I'm all right, man. I'm all right. You know, it's a uh, uh, very, very interesting day, busy day. People are learning a lot. They're blown away by uh, the discussion with Dr. Linda Jeffries. And uh, we see that a number of articles have been written about this 400th year anniversary and understanding the foundation of this uh, of this country and this foundation uh, in slavery. Uh, we see the 1619 project from the uh, uh, New York Times. Uh, I've seen a number of stories uh, on MSNBC, et cetera, and a number of articles being mm -hmm. written about this. So I wanted to bring you on to uh, talk about this history. You are a brilliant, brilliant historian, one of my teachers as well. So I wanted to talk about this history. And you and I had a good conversation yesterday <laughs> when I talked to you also. Mm. So uh, to start out with, and a lot of people uh, are familiar with you from Hidden Colors. You're in Hidden Colors 5. You're in uh, 1804, The Hidden History of Haiti, mm -hmm. from director Tariq Nasheed. So with you being from South Carolina, Professor Small, and we know that also South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union, December 20th, 1860. Um, what are your thoughts as we reflect on August 20th, 1619 and uh, 400, 400 years of those 29 Africans coming into Virginia? But we also know, and we'll talk about this, we also know the African people were here for tens of thousands of years before that. What, what are your initial thoughts on this? Well, you know, First of all, we know that 1619 don't it represents the beginning of our presence in North America. Mm -hmm. um, the 1619 don't even represent um, the beginning of our presence as enslaved Africans in North right. America. Right. Um, we don't know the date since the African is the Aboriginal community on every continent. Right. So we were here in North America as long as we were in Australia or India or China or Africa. Mm -hmm. And because the whites in America have either hidden or destroyed the anthropological and archaeological finds that show our presence, isn't it amazing that America, the most extraordinary scientific and wealthy academic institution in the world, hardly have anything on the anthropology and archaeology of North America anywhere. They have a few little thing on our Asiatic brothers who crossed the Bering Strait 10,000 years ago, who they call Indians. Mm -hmm. But after that, they have nothing that they present to the public because everything to be presented has gone black. Right. And they've hidden the anthropology, they've hidden the archaeological work and digs and, and its results from the population of America or the world. And so we have to make sure that we begin to do this research for ourselves. Yes. I think of 1619, you know, growing up in South Carolina, and I grew up on a plantation, a working plantation, and my grandma, who was the, the head female in the house, my mother and father lived in the house too with my grandparents and my great aunties. I mean, we all lived in one big house. Um, was a root woman or a traditional African priestess. Right. Her father was born in Africa and brought here as a little boy, him and his brother, and enslaved with their mom. They escaped from slavery when my great-great-grandfather was 16, and they came from Virginia. They had been sold into slavery in Georgetown, South Carolina, at the marketplace, slave market there, mm -hmm. to some people from Virginia. But at age 16, he escapes with his mom and his brother. And the only place he knows where to go is back to where he was sold into slavery. So they make their way back based on my great, great, great grandma's memory 
back to Georgetown, South Carolina. He was then picked up by some white folks, the Alston family, which was one of the richest families there at the time, and taken on as free labor. So my grandma was born, born to him, and 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 um, his his wife, my hope, who was from the Mendy people in Sierra Leone, and as a free woman, and so I come out of that line. Right. But on the other side of the line, my grandpa, who was from the Ghana Nigeria sector, and and the Yoruba and the Akan people are ninety nine plus percent the same genetic structure. They're just culturally different. Mm -hmm. So that's where grandpa comes out of. But his mom was an indigenous African from North America. We call her Grandma Martha. Okay. And through that line, we began to hear the stories. And grandpa used to take us to clean the mounds every year. I didn't realize until I got older that the mounds was the grave site of our ancestors, who was indigenous to this place, before Christopher Columbus and his folks came. And so it was just normal to walk through those woods and see those hills and to clean them and take the leaves off of them and, and put flowers on them. Or sometimes they would take them things like a fork, a cup, a plate, and we put them on it. I didn't understand that was for the ancestors. I didn't know, you know, they didn't give you the details. Right. After I began to learn more about African culture, I understood that you give the ancestors some objects so they can eat. Right. And so when they would go there and take them fruits and stuff and take them flowers, as children, you just do it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that those ancestors who were buried in those hills that we call mounds was different from the ones who came on the slave ship until I became older and realized that they were here before. Right. And, and I first learned the word Africa from my great my grandmother who neither read or write, but she was the root lady for the county for both whites and blacks. You'd be surprised how many white people use black indigenous medicine in the South. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. You know, so yeah. one of those priestess hey. who was powerful in that area. Hey, Professor James Small, do me a favor. If you could turn down the uh, volume on the computer a little bit, because I'm getting some feedback. I'm hearing some feedback okay. in the background. Okay, so you t uh, you talked about the mounds, and you talked about the indigenous people building the mounds. Now you said, I, I think you said on your grandmother's side, um, or your great grandmother was indigenous to this no, land. Yeah, my yeah. great grandmother on my grandfather's side. Okay, indigenous to this land. Now, are, are you indigenous? African, indigenous, Native American. I, I, I explain exactly what you mean when you say yeah, indigenous. Probably because she was as black as your shirt, mm -hmm. but her hair was as straight as silk. Yes. All right. So she must have. She might have been an admixture between our Asiatic brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and our early indigenous African population. Right. Uh, and there was a lot of people like that where I grew up. Yes. Um, there's an island there in the middle of the Waccamaw PD River. It's one of the big freshwaters island called Sandy Island. Mm -hmm. And everybody on there were the people who was indigenous to this land and the Asiatic native who they married into. Mm -hmm. My first child comes from that island. She was right. supposed to be my wife. That didn't work out. But we have a beautiful daughter, who mm -hmm. my eldest daughter. And if you saw her father, um, Mr. Nelson, you know, I couldn't figure out why he looked like a Chinese dude back coming from this black community. Right. But then, uh, his wife, who was as dark as your shirt, but as straight, the straight Asiatic type hair, uh, Miss Ophelia, you know, because we didn't make distinction then, we were just one black people. Right. As you go older, you try to work out why were these differences, and then we began to learn and read LeRon Bennett and doing studying, and began to say, oh, there's something they didn't tell us about ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I grew up along that whole belt um, from Beaufort, South Carolina, really from about Jacksonville, Florida, right, right on up to Wilmington, yeah, before the Mayflower. Right. And we get the revised edition because LeRon added a lot of new stuff to it. Well, this is the sixth edition. Now, which revision are you referring to? This is the sixth edition. The, the last one. Okay. 
That last one, it, it, it may be the sixth. That may be it. I have the hard cover of it. Okay. But it may be the sixth edition. But that whole belt from what is now called Jacksonville, Florida, really down further to Gainesville, mm-hmm. all the way up to Wilmington, North Carolina, that was the density of the African population that the European met here. And in one of Laurent's book, he tells how, I think it's in The Shaping of Black America, a chapter called The Red and the Black. And in that chapter, he, he talks about how the white folks made a decision and said, listen, the indigenous people look just like the ones we bring from Africa, so let's raid their village and enslave all of them. Right. And that war began, you know, in the early 1700s. And so the indigenous population and the newly arriving population, along with some of our Asiatic cousins, we amalgamated to create what we now call the African American. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and, and later on, uh, later on the day, uh, I'm going to have um, Dr. David M. Hotep on. Oh, that's that's my brother right there. Yeah, that's my man right there. Both the two of you. You know, some people call David Michael, and I call you David. Yeah, <laughs> hey, I talked. I talked to him. Yes, actually, I talked to him this morning, and he said, uh-huh. "Man, he said people keep asking me, man, are, are, are we are uh, the two of us related? Are you my son? Uh-huh. You know, but uh, the first Americans were Africans, documented evidence. So I." Um, I'll have Dr. David M. Hotep on around around 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll get into this, but see, this is this is the missing pages of world history, and this is the missing pages of the history of this country. And right. what you understand is that you you, you have the Khoisan who come from Southern mm-hmm. Africa, the ancestors to the Inu and the Twa. They go mm-hmm. all around the world. They're here mm-hmm. in this land here, going back at least 51,700 years, and Dr. David M. Docu- documents this. But mm-hmm. the Asians who come here thousands of years ago, and the Africans and Asians intermix. Right. And, and their offspring are who are called Native Americans, some of them, but then you also have Europeans that reclassify groups right. of African people that were here and call them Native Americans as well. Go ahead, Professor Smith. Well, let, let's go back just one, and then we'll come right back to that topic. Sure. Eight months ago, six Europeans left the Canary Islands in the North Atlantic off of the coast of West Africa in a rowboat and in six weeks landed in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Six white folks, six months ago. We had better ships than that. Yes. And we knew the trade wind. So Africans had been coming and going from North America to Africa for the centuries in between our indigenization of the place and the arrival of the Europeans. And so that population has to be accounted for as well. Yes. We there's folklore in the Malian history um, of their king coming and bringing hundreds of ships. And we go to Africa and we see paintings on walls of, of museums and, and hotels of Africans arriving on these shores and trading with the Asiatic natives. Mm-hmm. So the history of hundreds of years, we know for a fact that Christopher Columbus was given the coordinates to arrive here by Africans. In this you hemisphere, know, in this hemisphere. A man who was Christopher Columbus navigator was a young black man from Elmina, Ghana, where the first slave dungeon was built, Mm-hmm. with Christopher Columbus and his father-in-law participating in building that first dungeon. Mm-hmm. So we've got enough history to tie it in. We knew our people know that if you could get into a certain water current, you would end up in this place. Right. Okay. And, and, and understanding the winds and understanding the current because we were fishermen. We, we, we were sailors. So we knew we were here. Right. That's not a mystery. What happens in 1619 changes the the deck, changes the cards. Because now we have in our midst, not the Asiatic, not the African, but something has been added to that mix, and it is the European, the Western European particularly. And this Western European, Spain, France, England, Denmark, Germany, this population, particularly out of England, they're sending, they sent as much prisoners to North America as they had sent to Australia. We like to think of Australia as having been a prison colony. Well, almost equally as much of the Europeans sent to North America 
were people taken out of the prisons of Europe. They right. cleared their prisons. They cleared the streets of their hoodlums and their gangsters. And they sent them over here to work off their onus or time to whatever wealthy European had put claim on a piece of land, Lord Barton and Lord Top and Lord whomever, and so they would have a certain amount of years to work these farms, to send this produce back, and they would allow it to be free. And right. so the population we are dealing with over here, this is not European royalty. This isn't even European working class. This is the children of the European criminal class, the dregs of Europe class. That group with no values, no ethical, moral foundation to talk about would clash with our civilization. Exactly. On the exactly. continent of Africa and here in North America. So in 1619, when this, I think it's a Dutch man of war, or Dutch it was actually, well, well, John Roth, who had married Pocahontas, he recorded it as a Dutch warship, but it was actually an English uh, two English warships, the White Line and the uh, uh, the Treasure an pirate ships, ship. pirate an English, English pirate, pirate ship. ships. Yes. because Queen Elizabeth was financing these pirates mm -hmm. to steal the cargoes of the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Dutch, mm -hmm. because they didn't have no real holdings over here yet. Jamestown would represent that first opportunity for them. Right. So when these pirates brought these Africans that they had stolen from either a Spanish or Portuguese ship. Portuguese, yeah. Portuguese ship into uh, Port Comfort, which was really what is now Hampton, Virginia, and not Jamestown at all. Right. Um, I think now they call it Fort Monroe. Um, they exchanged them for food and water and supplies. Mm -hmm. And so the deal appeared that the Africans now would have to work to pay for that food, water, supplies, and other things that these people in, in, in the Hampton area had given to these pirates. And I, I understand that all of them eventually got their freedom mm -hmm. because what we know as chattel slavery had not begun in America yet. Right. And it did not even begin in the South or in Virginia, it began in Massachusetts. Yeah, in 1641, uh, Massachusetts, yeah. that's the first colony in this area, first British colony to have codified slave laws, Massachusetts in 1641. Yes, sir. Right. And so Jamestown, what it represents now today, what we are seeing today is the white myth of Jamestown. Mm -hmm. Because most of what we heard about Jamestown is mythology. There's no history to back any of that mythology up. The first groups came over here. Um, I'm sure Dr. Jeffrey spoke about it. They, you know, they died. And the next group, the Native Americans had to help them to survive. Right. And they would turn on the people who helped them to survive. Exactly. There were one group that sailed back to Europe and had to had carry on selective cannibalism of their own peers on the ships in order to make it back to Europe alive. So these stories are not told. You know, they make it look like we came over and we were the pilgrims and we established this place and we brought a whole new light to the world. No, that's not what, what this was. This was <laughs> an attack on another civilization. Right. It's in genocide on that civilization. Your diseased body led the vanguard to the destruction of that civilization. The influenza virus and the common cold virus, of which there are thousands, did not exist in this hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And so when it was brought from Europe, the influenza virus, and particularly the common cold virus, killed millions of people. They didn't do it with guns on a battlefield. Stop playing. That's not what happened. Your disease being, my, micro, what's that thing called? Microscopic disease being killed most of the population of North America within the first 100 years. Mm. You know, and the same thing with South America. Right. You need to put that in there so people will stop pretending this great macho, uh, gallant, knight, warrior type came and took this land. That's not what happened. Right, right. Those who did come right. mm -hmm. and practice genocide with their swords and their guns did just that. Practice genocide upon a people who had been who had reached out to help them 
of people who was open and inclusive and found themselves being betrayed by someone whose value system was based on warfare and taking from other human beings. Right, exactly. Um, I encourage people to, as well. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. What'd you say? The reflection of that behavior, the behavior of those at, at Jamestown, the behavior of those who would turn on the very native people who had helped them to survive, the behavior of those who would threaten to kill when, because after the Jamestown incident, other Africans who came into this situation were in an indentured capacity. Mm -hmm. Right. But then a decision was made after the Massachusetts law and a few other states for Virginia and what would burgeon into the southern states to also create this, your servant for life. Mm -hmm. to the African population. And, and in Leron Bennett's book, he points out that any whites, and many whites in the early days did rebel with the Africans because they were in servitude, the poor whites also. Yeah. And so he made laws to penalize the whites who would make comradeship with us that was even more brutal than the laws they made to punish us because they needed our capacity as labor and as scientists and as agrarianists and agriculturalists to make this experiment they were trying to pull off work. Right, right. Yeah, and we see that We see that rebellion in uh, Bacon's Rebellion, 1675, 1676 in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Bacon's Rebellion. Um, just very quickly here, uh, people should check out uh, this, this book, book number one, book one and two by Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very African, funny. yeah. African people and European holidays and mental genocide. African people and European holidays uh, of mental genocide. Because one of the things he talks about in here, he deals with a timeline of history going back to about 1607, or even going into the 15, 14, 1500s. But he, he talks about how from 1611 to 1783, England empties its jails yeah, and, yeah. Sends, and sends all these criminals over here. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> to work so, out so, their indentures. So, 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 that's why when we see the behavior we are seeing in Charlottesville, mm -hmm. in Oregon, in another place, we think it's an anomaly. No, it's not. That's who their fathers were. Mm -hmm. They're behaving in line with the cultural thread mm -hmm. that has run through their community from the inception of their coming to North America to now. We've been fed a myth that another type of white person came here. And then we wonder <laughs> why these good Christians are behaving in this manner. Because right. that's the myth. That's not the reality. You know? Right. So when we seriously get into history and realize what we are really dealing with, it's like having a discussion about America, talking about our country and our beautiful constitution and our our, our way of life that the founding fathers wanted. The founding fathers were a bunch of criminals. Right. <laughs> they enslaved people. They were pedophiles. They raped little girls. The majority, and I think of Robin Williams talk about this, the majority of black female who were sent from African enslavement process were children under 15. Mm -hmm. And 100% of them was raped and molested by the white men who ran the slave ships, the auction house, and the plantations. So we're talking about pedophiles, right. rapists, murderers, while at the same time denying the humanity of the person they're raping. But right. then that same woman nursed their baby from their white woman's belly on her black breasts. Exactly. Exactly. It's a whole, it's the, the whole history is a history of dichotomies, a history of contradictions. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. What'd you say? So we're dealing with a schizophrenic culture mm -hmm. based on lies. When you talk about founding fathers and the constitution and all these beautiful symbols that they were copying from Freemasonry and from the, the Iroquois Confederation, because they didn't invent this shit. They right. talked about Magna Carta. They, the Magna Carta didn't say nothing about none of this. The, the Iroquois Federation Constitution is closer to this than anything else. And the Sonic uh, dictums are where much of this come out of. And so, and that comes straight out of Kemet. Exactly. So, while they're plagiarizing 
our ethical and moral system into their new Republican system. They're carrying on genocide, rape, and murder on a daily basis. The very people who are doing this plagiarizing, proclaiming the great republic, is carrying on rape and murder every day against African people. Exactly, exactly. And, so and when you culture persists to this day, that I can stand up in Congress and I can mouth all of these wonderful ideological um, things and then go back to Mississippi, Alabama, Chicago, or someplace else and participate in the daily genocide economically, politically, and culturally of the African-American population. Exactly. Exactly. Without a thought. Mm -hmm. Because exactly. that's normalcy for them. You see? Right. This is a beautiful picture that you have of the pharaoh and the Tekken on the continent. And yep. like, that's deep, Michael. I've never seen this one. Coming straight out, this, this stuff comes this straight out of ancient Kemet, the Washington Monument. 555 feet tall is a Tekken, the ancient African symbol of resurrection. There are about 1,200 Tekken new all throughout ancient Kemet. And, and mm -hmm. Tony Browder breaks that. Tony Browder breaks a lot of this stuff down in Egypt on yes, the Potomac. Does. Yeah, Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. So all this history and see what was and, and see this is the these are the teachings taken into Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, who were Africans, also called Moors, right. but were African people first and foremost. The, the Moors is a Roman is the. English corruption of the Roman word Marush, which simply means black. Mm -hmm. So that we don't get confused about whether that was another kind of black people. Right, right. These are African people. And they're taking the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa, especially ancient Kemet, into Europe. And right. these teachings bring Europe out of the dark ages. Absolutely. But it's gonna be to our detriment. All that stuff we talked and came about to kick us in the behind. We woke up the beast. <laughs> yeah. We woke up the beast. And because it was asleep and <laughs> most people don't understand how they got into this thing called the dark ages mm -hmm. when Islam was black before it become melanotized and white as it is today. And if anybody have any questions about me saying that about Islam, tell them I'm also al Hajj Amin Shaheed, former imam of the Muslim Mosque Inc. Been right. to twice so I can discuss Islam without being discriminatory. You've been to Mecca twice for your Hajj. Yes, sir. Yes. And went before the Rabat Alim al Islamin. Very few people go before the World Council of Islam and sign the book. My name is under the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. You hear me? Yeah. So I can speak on the critique of our history when Islam was black mm -hmm. before it became Malatitized and Turkish white. Right. And so at that time, when we took over the Mediterranean basin, we cut Europe off from world trade and caused an economic depression, which they referred to as the Dark Ages. And that economic depression lasted for hundreds of years and created not just a psychologically diseased society, but a physiologically diseased society, which produced the bubonic plague or the Black Plague that killed more than 50% of the Europe population at the time because they didn't have access to healthy food and good food. They didn't have access to spice and salt to, to, to preserve because we had taken over the Mediterranean basin. And it was the Africans of North Africa, the Moors who had become Islamized that went into Europe and rescued them. We built hospitals, we built universities, we built water viaduct, we took them soap, we showed them how to take baths, we took them medicine. Okay? Yeah. And, and, and so our reward for doing that is the genocide that became known as the transatlantic slave trade. Exactly. See, I was talking to Professor Kava just a couple of days ago, man, and really in my research, because see, but you, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor Kava Kamenei, taught, taught me to understand, you see, the two ways you can look at the transatlantic slave trade. You can look at it episodically as an episode in history, or you can look at it chronologically. And mm -hmm. Professor yeah. Cabo, See, Professor, that's an epic. Yeah. yeah, and Professor Cabo was one of the first ones that taught me to, uh, he, he talks about how to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. That's so right. I learned a lot about the history of the Moors from Professor Cabo Kamene and uh, Professor, uh, um, and uh, Dr. Um, Jose ben Pimenta Bay. Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay. And you, when you see what happened with the Moors in Europe, 
the mm. transatlantic slave trade is really Europeans getting revenge on the Africans Absolutely. for hundreds of years in Europe. That's exactly what occurred. It's a continuum. It didn't just start. No. You, you can see, like, so let me give you an example. When I was taking Africana Studies classes at Wayne State University in 1994, 1995, where I graduated from, we started the Africana Studies classes in the 15th century, mm. mid 1400s. Well, I was already studying Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Dr. Naeem Akbar, Dr. Ivan Van Sertum, all this stuff. I'm like, wait a second, how do you skip over all this history and start, you know, mm -hmm. but, we, but in those classes, we didn't deal with the history of the Moors. That's why this book right here, Golden Age of the Moor, yeah. Dr. Ivan Van Sertum is so crucial. That's a bad piece. You got to yeah. study that book. Yeah, it's so crucial. Renoka Rashidi, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, Dr. Wayne Chandler, Yon Karu, Dr. John G. Jackson all have essays in here. So when we deal with this history, we have to deal with it chronologically, and you have to deal with the history of the Moors. Because once you start studying that, the Moors introduce uh, the periodic tables. They introduce something called alchemy, which becomes chemistry. They introduced uh, cotton, all this stuff into Europe. And they, they simply took African civilization. Yes as taken to its height by Enkemet, mm -hmm. and they moved it into Southern Europe, which mm -hmm. then spread across Europe. Yes. Because we, by the time the, the Moors, the African Moor, Moors, that's why I like the term black moor because the word means black. And so by the time they're moving with Islam, we've been through Greek occupation of Kemet, we've been through Roman occupation of Kemet, Yep. We had been to an early Assyrian and Persian occupation of Kemet. Mm -hmm. And so the Kemetian civilization and its science and scientists had moved west into what is called North Africa. Right. And that body of knowledge was filtering down into Africa, but it was taken up through the Iberian Peninsula because as they were re attacking us on the east, mm -hmm. we were driving out the Romans and the Ostrogoth Germans who had invaded us from the Iberian Peninsula hundreds of years earlier. We right. have this discussion, we rarely had a discussion of the Ostrogoths, Germanic tribes, who had come all the way from the Caucasus Mountain across Europe with the Vistagoth that had destroyed the Roman Empire. The Ostrogoths came and invaded, uh, as a part of trying to destroy the Roman Empire, invaded North Africa. Right. Well, our reaction to that, mm -hmm. using Islam as an organizing instrument, was to drive them back across the, the straits, back into Europe, back into the mountains of the Castile, and take control of Southern France and Spain for the Africans. Okay, so you're talking about 8th century AD, seven, like 711 right. AD, when they go into Yes, yes sir. Yes. Right, so, so they had a reconnaissance mission in 710 AD. They mm -hmm. go in to get the lay of the land, and they're fighting against the Vandals and the Visigoths. Okay? Yes. Uh, and the Vandals of the Visigoths come down in 5th century AD. Uh, the date that's given is 476 AD and crush the western portion of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And this is who these African Moors are fighting against. They settle in, uh, uh, now at this time it's not called Spain, it's the Iberian Peninsula. Yeah, it wasn't even called the Iberian Peninsula at the time. They had another name, but... The, okay, what, what name was that? It's a land mass we're talking about that's today called Spain and Portugal. Right, right. And in the area that the Africans sell in, they call Al Andalus. Um, Andalus. Yeah, Al Andalus. And when you talk about, um, uh, if we look at page 40, now this is the sixth edition of Before the Mayflower, people. Pay attention to this. This is chapter two. We look at page 40. Lerone Bennett Jr., I'm, I'm going to quote this paragraph. Check this out. Lerone Bennett Jr. said, of all of, of all of the improbable aspects of this situation, he's talking about in 1690, that period of time, 1690, mm -hmm. okay, before codified slave laws, okay, uh, in, in the first colony to have codified slave laws was uh, Massachusetts, yes, yes. of all of the improbable, improbable aspects of this situation, the oddest, the oddest, O-D-D-E-S-T, to modern blacks and whites is that white people did not seem to know that they were white, white from what our concept of whiteness is, okay? Back at this time, early 17th century. It appears from surviving evidence that the first white colonists had no concept of themselves as quote unquote white people. Right. The, the legal documents identified whites as Englishmen and or Christians, okay? The word white 
with its burden of arrogance and biological pride developed late in the in the century he's talking about late in the 17th century is basically mm -hmm. after bacon's rebellion in 1675 1676 developed late in the century as a direct result of slavery and the organized debasement of blacks the mm -hmm. same point can be made now check this out everybody the same point can be made from the other side of the line for a long time in colonial America, there was no legal there was no legal name to focus white anxiety. The first blacks were called blackamores, moors, nagers, N-E-G-E-R-S, and nagars, N-E-G-A-R-S. The word all of negro, which means black. All of which means black. The word negro, N-E-G-R-O, a Spanish and Portuguese term for black did not come into general use in Virginia until the latter part of the century, the latter part of the 17th century. So mm -hmm. this goes right into what you were talking about, about Blackamoor. Talk about mm -hmm. the term Blackamoor, because also in Detroit, there's a street called Blackamoor. But talk about that for a minute. All right, well, we first see this word that would become more with the Roman invasion after the downfall of um, What's our brother's name? Um, with the elephants. Oh, Hannibal. Hannibal. Yeah. yeah. Once the Romans move in and take over, right? They just they in their literature they're describing the people. Yes. Yes. And they went and the area they had landed in Tunisia, Algeria. Mm -hmm. That area was called Afri. 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 Okay. Yeah. That was the ethnic black group that lived there. That their, their ethnic name was Afri. Afri. So the Romans write in their literature that we're going to Afri land, or Ka, which is the Roman acronym for land, we're going to Afri land where the Marouche live. Right. Okay. So they went to Afri land where the Marouche live. Right. Oh, you, you, you always have your stuff, don't you? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so the word Africa, and Ka is just the Roman acronym for land onto the Afri. Mm -hmm. That doesn't come in to general uses until the Arab take over the Islamic system in North Africa, really after 1492. Before that, Africa was not a known word for anybody except the ethnic nation in Tunisia and Algeria, who at that time, black people and not Arab people. Right. Yeah. So the Romans says we are going to Africa, Af the Afri, the land of the Afri, where the Marouche, the blacks live. Mm -hmm. That's all they were saying. The Marouche become Moreno in Spanish and Moors in English. Mm -hmm. Simply means black. Exactly. So, so that we don't confuse one group of black people as though they're separate from the other group of black people. No, this is the white man calling us Moors and the white man calling us Marouche. Even though I hear some argument fighting that that's our word. All words are our words because we created the first language. So the etymology will tell you that every other language evolved. And even their boy, Martin Burnell, one of their best linguists, shows that all European languages evolved out of African language systems by the Greek and so forth. Right. We don't know like from there. Yeah, Martin Bernal wrote Black Athena. Right, Burnell. Yeah. So Burnell. We, we, what we want to look at like in this 1619, somebody messed around and opened Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. And though they've been lying about Pandora's box all these years, somebody messed around and did a hearing in Congress the other day and opened, took the lid off the box. Oh, you're talking about the June 19th uh, HR 40 hearing? Yes, sir. Yes. And <laughs> even though I've heard a lot of criticism of it, you got, when you're in politics, Mm -hmm. You got to understand every weapon is a weapon, minimal or, or maximum. Mm -hmm. And you use the weapon the best you can for your cause. Right. And I think that hearing opened Pandora's box. They had been fighting to keep the lid on it. Yep. But now when I hear the discussions by black male and female professors all over national television, people who would dare not speak up before. Mm hmm but because they feel a legitimacy now, the knowledge that they've learned from the Dr. Jeffries, Dr. Clark generation, these black professors, they are speaking with authority. 
on the history of African, African American and the lie that is the description of the birth of America. Right. The whole story about America's birth is a lie. Mm -hmm. The whole story about America's democracy, Republican justice system is a lie because it's predicated on denying that the overwhelming majority of your history was involved with the imprisonment and the enslaving in, in work camps you call plantation of the world's first population. Right. Not because you didn't like them or because they're black, but they were the engineers, the scientists, the agrarianists, the herbalists, <coughs> the horticulturalists that created the wealth that built what you now call Western civilization. That created the wealth that produced the Industrial Revolution. That created the wealth that gives Chase Bank the, the finance and the wealth they got from working with the Rothschild in, in, in London, buying steel to build the rail lines, to bring the cotton from Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi to the East Coast and then up north to be shipped overseas to the textile mills of London and Germany and the other places. And so they come into being off of slave money or the watch city bank with their beautiful advertisement today did not tell us that they came into being out of Canal Bank in New Orleans who had as his primary collateral black human beings' lives up against land and equipment for farming and agriculture. And, and we can go on and on, but that is the, to tell the truth about America, would have to put to sleep the lie of a, a system of justice, equality, and republicanism that took them to took into regards the humanity of all of its players. Absolutely. You know? Let me um, let me uh, <laughs> about this book very quickly here. This is one of the many books by Dr. John Henrik Clark, okay, one of our great mm -hmm. scholar words, African people in world history, African people in world history. So you talked about the Afri, and I, and I explained to people because see, a lot of our people are under the misconception that Africa was named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. Mm. Africanus is Took Latin. that name because he conquered the land. Yeah, right. Well, Africanus is Latin, which means belonging to Africa, or it can mean of Africa. When you do the research, he took that surname after right. he conquered the that that area. That but, on page, yes. but on page 14 of uh, African People in World History, Dr. Clark talks about how the Nile Valley's first age of high, <laughs> high cultural, the, not the Nile Valley's first age of high cultural grandeur lasted until the eve of the Christian era. Some aspects of it survived the Greek and Roman occupation of parts of North Africa. After the rise and decline of Greek civilization and the Roman destruction of the city of Carthage, so Carthage is destroyed right around 143 BC, okay? Mm -hmm. The Romans organized the conquered territories into a province they called Africa, a word mm -hmm. derived from Afri, A-F-R-I, Afri. Mm -hmm the name of a group of people about whom little is known. This was a new name because previously all dark-skinned people were called Ethiopians since, since the but Greeks- But Ethiopian now is a Greek word. It's well, not yeah, that's what he word. says. That's what, that's what he says. Since, <laughs> since the Greeks referred to Africa as Ethiopia, the land of the burnt-faced people. But when we look at, when we look at um, what, what he's talking about, Carthage, the, um, the Carthage is what today is Tunisia, that area, basically Tunisia, right. okay? And their ethnic name was Afriye, or Afri. Afriye, yeah, this is, Afriye where Afri, Afriye. this is where Afri in Africa is coming from. Af Africa basically means land of the Afri, it's right. and it's referring to this area. So Africa was not named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. No. His, family's name name. His family's last name was Scipio. His family's last name was not Africanus, it was Scipio. Because his brother conquered a part of Asia and right. tacked Asia onto his name. Asiaticus, yeah. exactly, exactly. So, so the history, the, our understanding of this history is backwards. No. Yes. I, I, yeah, so people, this is why we have to do the research, okay? So African People in World History uh, by Dr. John Henry Clark. Well, I'm going to mm -hmm. have to come and raise your library. You got some good stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I well, I, I even have a Latin English dictionary because when I was doing research on the origins of the term Africa, see, I consulted a Latin English dictionary. So mm -hmm. I go to the language. So I could break it down based upon the language. Now, when we talk, you talked about HR 40 and um, 
in the mm-hmm. hearing. And 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 you and I talked about this before because one of the good things that came from the hearing, and we saw some of the idiots that the Republicans put up. They brought out right. uh, 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 this retired football player. I forgot his name uh, from 1970s. And you know, see the the, the Democrats brought Dr. Julian Malvo, who's a brilliant economist, and they brought Tana Hesse Coates. And Tiny Hesse Coates wrote the uh, 17 page expose for the June 2004 edition of the Atlantic called The Case for Reparations. Everybody needs to go yeah, online yeah. and read that because mm-hmm. this brother did his research. And what he's yeah, dealing yeah. with is not just 246 years, 246 years of slavery, he's dealing with the legacy of slavery yeah, and the yeah. maldistribution of wealth, power, and resources based upon racism, which is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. And he's showing us how it impacts us today. And see, that's the mo- that's the most important thing. You got to connect the two. Okay. Right. Now, there's two books I think will be helpful to people, mm-hmm. and and that's um, the Miseducation of the Negro. Yeah. By yeah. Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Right. It should be a must read. That should be the the maiden book we read when we come back into our history. Right. The second one is the Island of Meme by Dr. Wade Nobles. Okay. Now. That was a new book, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And when you get it, and it said the island of meme, the unfinished Haitian revolution. Right. But it's using the Haitian revolution only as a prototype of the mind conditioning, the damage, and, and the colonization of the African mind by European culture and values. And then he goes into a description by looking at how the the Haitian in the initial phase of the revolution freed their mind with African understanding, knowledge, value, and and beliefs, where we would have to do to now free our minds. Right. It is though he stepped right out of Carter G into this book. So if you read Carter G, when you finish that book, you gotta read The Island of Meme by Dr. Nobles, where he refers to our problem as being a mimetic European infection of thought. So Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the miseducation. Yes, sir. Yeah. I knew you had it, brother. Yep. And then, you got that old edition, too. Yep. It, so, this is from uh, October 19th, 1994. That's when I got it. Oh, that. that's the 94. Okay. Yeah. I would also encourage, I, I would encourage people to study Dr. Carter G. Woodson also. Yes. Because this is a brilliant An brother. extraordinary brother. Yeah, so this book right here is by Dr. Pay, uh, Payro Dagbovi, who's a history professor at Michigan State University. Okay, mm-hmm. so right here, Carter G. Woodson in, in Washington, D.C., The Father of Black History. Excellent, excellent book on Dr. Carter G. Woodson himself and what he went through to try to educate our people. And he's the co-founder of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915 in Chicago, which the mm-hmm. Native Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. And this past weekend, uh, Professor Small- Dr. Just, Thompson was a big part of that. Yes, yeah. it, this past weekend in Detroit, we just had the 37th annual African World Festival at the Charles Oh, H. wow, yes. okay, it was this weekend. Yeah, this past weekend. So I was uh, not just a vendor, but I was also doing presentations inside the museum, dealing with black mm-hmm. migration, 1619 to 2019, uh, mm-hmm. from the birth of a nation to the red summer 1919 to the Detroit race ride in 1943. Mm-hmm. Black migrations is this year's annual theme for African American History Month. And see, most okay. of our people don't know there's an annual theme for Black History Month or African American History Month, which comes from ASAWA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And it gives you a whole understanding of, it, it makes the celebration relevant. Mm-hmm. And so this year's theme is Black migrations, not just dealing with the transatlantic slave trade, but also dealing with the great migration of 1915 and 1970, which totally changed this country which right. includes the rebellions, includes the Red Summer 1919, all this stuff. So when I, when I do the presentations, you know, and, and when I, I, I spoke at about 15 different events this past February for mm-hmm. Black History Month, 99% of our people don't know there's an annual theme. For, for yeah, the- I didn't know there was an annual theme. Okay, yeah, there's an annual theme. There's one going back to 19, all the way back to 1928. They're, they're annual themes. The annual themes give purpose to the celebration, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, so if people go to asala.org, A-S-A, 
LH.org, Association for the Study of African American Life and History. They, every year, they have the information there for the theme. They have some type of resources and guidance for teachers to be able to mm -hmm. teach this in the classroom. So we don't have to keep recycling the same 15 to 20 seconds. Reinventing the wheel over and over again. Yeah, yeah, dude, this is deep. When you look at this year's theme for Black Migrations, it, it, it encompasses the Garvey Movement, the Harlem Renaissance, uh, World War One, World War Two. all of this stuff is deep. You know, and, and, and it's also supposed to be studied all year, not just in February. This right. It's supposed to be studied all year. Yeah, that, that part I've always understood. Yeah, now, yeah. one of the key things when we come back to the 1619, it's odd that th this has triggered so much, even in Africa and Ghana, they just had the year of return and it was based on the 1619. Yeah, yeah. And right, one of my right. comrades has written a book from Jamestown to Jamestown. Okay. Um, he's one of the brothers who was the founder of the Panifest and the Emancipation Day. Mm -hmm. um, he was also a diplomat and a member of parliament in Ghana for many years before he got more involved in the culture movement. And he also established a university over there, a technical university that he's uh, the chancellor of. So this move, you know, when you can wake up something when it's time to wake up an idea. For people to look at 1619 and says, okay, where did we go from there? But then the most pressing question, where did we come from to get there? Right. You know, how did we get to Jamestown? What was Europe before Jamestown? Mm -hmm. What was Europe? What was there? Right. You, well, you, had, Africa there. you had Africa. You, you were impaling people and you were burning people at the stakes. And Spanish Inquisition. You know, so what was Europe? What civilization Western existed in Europe at the time of Jamestown? Mm -hmm. Who was that population of Europeans that made up Jamestown? Remember, the Puritans are not here yet. Right. right. Then there's no Plymouth Rock yet. Right. Okay? So that myth difference. that we were fleeing or they were fleeing uh, religious persecution and came here to find it, but that's that's mythology. Right. Um, what was going on over here? And 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 we're looking at the wars that's going on between Spain and Britain, the war that's going on between France and Germany. Europe is into warfare that has lasted nearly a hundred years at this point. Right. We're coming out of the bubonic plague, which is almost a hundred years of the, a disease population that had to do with lack of hygiene mm -hmm. and no medical science to treat the diseases that was produced from their filth. And so this is what Europe is. Africa has already built 10 or 15 civilization, the Kilwa civilization, the Congo civilization, the, the Kemetic civilization multiple times. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the Ghana, the Sangha, the Mali, um, other civilizations with extraordinary things that's feeding Europe. One of the biggest commodities Dr. Clark told us during the times of the Moors going from Africa to Europe was not gold, wasn't salt, it was books. Mm -hmm. They'd never seen a book. We invented the book <laughs> and, and, and sold it to them. So we need to study what were we doing who, why, why did we have um, a Borneo? What was the kingdom of Borneo? What was the kingdom of Sungai? What was the kingdom of Mali? What was the kingdom of Kilwa? All of these African civilizations, what was the great kingdom? See, you got it, you own it, brother. Yeah, the, the great kingdom of the Congos that had um, major metropolis, major cities with grid streets, and the Portuguese would draw pictures of the beautiful cities with their grid streets and send it back to Europe. You can find them in books. Going to Benin and find a major civilization with multi-story buildings, you know, and going to Ethiopia and find them with bath houses. Right. With yeah. a horse. Oh, they go down the ways, but Dr. that's Man. a bad Man. book right there. Y'all and me. He's unfinished revolution. Dr. Uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries talked about this earlier also, yes. He was right. down in the, the bottom of one of the stacks here, so I had yeah. to throw this. Go ahead. An extraordinary document that should be a must-read. But when we study 
what was in Africa before 1492. Yes. Just to pose that beside what is in Europe prior to 1492. Mm -hmm. And then ask whose civilization? You know, whose civilization? Exactly. The, the first universities in Europe, the Moors take that to them. The first so hospital awesome. complex, the first, uh, the, the Romans had worked on an aqueduct system, but the Moors revolutionized that aqueduct system in Spain and Southern France. Mm -hmm. And it was copied in other parts of Europe. And, and the medical books that was used in Europe until the, the 20th century were the comedic medical books, most of which was written in Arabic or rewritten in Arabic and brought to Europe by the Moors. This is right up to the 20th century, books yeah. in surgery and general medicine. So we have to really ask ourselves, why did they bring us to North America? And why did they enslave our indigenous population of North America mm -hmm. and put us in labor camps called plantations to build what is now one of the most technocratized civilization in modern times called the United States of America and one of the wealthiest? We built it. I hear them talk about the immigrants built America. When the, an appreciable immigrant population came, the basic wealth and the wealthy families had already all been made. Right, that's true. That's true. By and, the agriculture and the technology of the African. And, and at the same time, when we say that and deal with the facts, it's, it's not from a perspective of us trying to demonize immigrants coming to this country. I don't have to justify myself when I talk about immigrants. If they want to feel demonized, that's their problem. Right. Nobody's going to put me on the defensive to be right. the black man. Right, okay. exactly. So we're, we're talking about the history. We're talking about the everybody. chronology of history. It's not trying right. to attack anybody. We're dealing yeah. with the chronology. We don't have to apologize in any way. Right. Because exactly. all hands have been up against us. Right. You don't want me to roll up on you? Put your hands down. Right, exactly. Don't stand with my enemy and play pretty boy. Put right. your hands down. Let right. me see my enemy. Get out the way. Right. Let me right. get to him. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Okay. You're saying you don't protect the enemy. You so don't That's protect right. those who are yes. Get out of the way. Right. You're my cousin. I take right. care of my cousin. You're family. Mm -hmm. you, you're lost. You don't know your history either. Right. So let me deal with the thing that I've learned better than anybody because I've lived in the house of the masters. Right. I've lived in the palace of the king. Right. That has created this tyranny in the world called lazy fair capitalism and the genocides it has caused. Mm -hmm. I know him better than anybody. Right. Let me at him. Right. And, I can handle him. And, and, that's, and that's why the truth about the history <laughs> can be taught as well, because we've all been miseducated. We've yes. all been miseducated on the history. And when, <laughs> when, when, I, when I talk about understanding white supremacy and racism, white supremacy pits groups of oppressed people against each other to fight one another. So mm -hmm. one percent or ten percent stays in power and profits off of the exploitation of different groups of people. That's okay. been the key to them being able to stay in power as a minority. Mm -hmm. But there's a peculiarity they've created yeah. and marginalized and vilified the densest of the African population. Everybody have chose to side with the villain. Mm -hmm. so that they don't have to be marginalized and vilified. Right. Where does that lead me to identify you? So what I'm saying to my cousins, be careful. Right, exactly. Be because, careful. Because as I explain to people, they uh, if you look, if you, so I explain it this way. If you talk about <laughs> banning Muslims on Monday, mm -hmm. and, if you, if you, and if you are uh, demonizing Mexicans on Tuesday and demonizing uh, Hispanics on Tuesday, if you're going in to Jewish synagogue, shooting people on Wednesday and desecrating uh, 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 cemet Jewish cemeteries, then on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, they're coming after us. They're no, doing it to all the people. Doing all of this to us before they got to well, any well, of that. Well, that's true. No, I understand that. So I, let I understand me put that. that in the context. Yeah, yeah that, so that, that was the able to do that to them. Right. Because when they were doing all of these things to us, they said nothing. Right. Exactly. Matter of fact, they sat at the table and tried to have a meal, 
mm-hmm. based on the rewards that came from doing this. Right. right. So the chickens have come home to roost. Exactly. And I'm not mad at you. Mm-hmm. The chickens come home to roost. Let's learn from the experience. Right. Let's band together and deal with our common enemy. Right. You're yeah. not going to make me feel guilt mm-hmm. because in your betrayal, you got betrayed. And now you look around at the person you betrayed and say, I'm being betrayed. I tried to tell you. You're like, what's up? You know, it's it's like um, here in Detroit, and this happened in some other cities. Here in Detroit, during the 2016 election, you had black people who were telling Arabs and Chaldeans here in Detroit that Trump, if he becomes president, he's going to deport your relatives. And they didn't believe him. No. And, and this is what he did. And exactly. We, we, try, we were trying to tell you. You thought he was just playing. No, you out in Dearborn having a ball. Yeah, Dearborn, Michigan. Suburb mm-hmm. is high Arab population in Dearborn. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Well, that's one of the problem has been, and that's why we've got a situation with Ados. Mm-hmm. See? People and... And somebody told me, so you know, Ados is running one of your videos. That video is from 10 years ago. I don't know where they found it. I like to get a copy of it because I did go on one of their websites and listen to it. Somebody produced Ados. Okay. And it's easy for us to say, oh, they with the right wing. That's crap. That's not what produced Ados. Mm-hmm. Conditions produce things. Yeah. And some of our own cousins got to understand you can't be part of the condition that cause a reaction. And when the reaction comes from a powerful force that you negated, then you cry foul Mm -hmm. because you misunderstood that you cannot push a people by so far, there will be an explosion. Even in the most non-volatile elements in nature, squeeze it enough and you will split the atoms. Right. Right. Now let's pray that Ados was will evolve mm-hmm. with some clearer understanding of African unity and Pan Africanism. Mm-hmm. And we know you and I haven't been around long enough. Some of that evolution is going to take place. Some people are running for the excitement of things we saw with Black Lives Matter and other things that popped up on the scene yep. and disappeared yep. as fast as they popped up. <laughs> yeah. And but but we know from being out here what most of our young people are looking for has to do with Pan Africa's African identity, African connection, self determination, a way to feed and clothe myself and my family, a way to be one with my people, and yet not necessarily be a vengeful enemy to no other people. That has been the nature of our African fight. And so every now and then, though, you're going to get a bubble like the ADOS being squeezed, and it's going to be an explosion. I don't know if it's a necessary good or a necessary evil. I'm, I initially, I was critical, and then I backed away and said, you know what? Stop, listen, and learn. See what you can learn from this. Because when I go back and listen to some of my speeches, I weren't that far to a right position, but I was making some of those same observations as being necessary if we were to have the unity we were talking about. You can't keep having an excuse that your poverty is the reason why you side with my enemy, but my poverty should be the reason why I commit uh, suicide to save you when you side with my enemy. Right. So we got to get, we got to get some kind of relationship. And that's why history, as Dr. Noble says, history erases the mystery. Yeah. And allow you to realize your, your miracle. So I find that one of the greatest weapons in our hands is our history. Right. right. Of all the weapons we got, that's the greatest weapon we've got. And when that weapon, and that's what makes you so beautiful, and I've watched you over the years and the work you do, oh, and I've watched you grow and yeah, get yeah, yeah. to be an extraordinary teacher. Thank you. Thank with you. this history. This history allows you to view the world through lenses that let you see mm-hmm. a reality that, 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 that is totally different from what has been presented to us. Right. I right. see myself as an African. And somebody said, well, what does that mean? You're not from Africa. You're born in South Carolina. Africa is not a place. It can be that. Africa is not even a culture. It could be that. 
Africa is a way of understanding the universe and our relationship to it and this relationship to us as codified through tens of thousands, if not more years of experience of our ancestors, delineating the best possible approach to being a human being and having a relationship with other human beings and other things in nature. That's what being an African is to me. Absolutely. You know, and that's at the foundation of all of our civilizations. You know, I, um, I learned this uh, about the pyramid principle from uh, you and Dr. Leonard Jeffries. You all are two yeah. of my teachers. And um, I, I use this when I teach as well. And I got I had one that had both your pictures up here and I can't find it out the revise this again yeah, your picture. That's, my, that's my big brother and my father right there yes yeah. so. but but when you all teach you talk about uh the pyramid principle on how the foundation is african history and culture it gives mm -hmm. you the values our interests and our principles and influences our economics and politics talk talk about that for a minute because this is extremely important and and, and the other thing is it doesn't matter how much money we have if the foundation is not in place you're in trouble. You to spend ninety-seven percent of those dollars. People don't look, don't look like us. Talk talk about this. The pyramid principle. Yes, sir. Because you can't separate it. Mm -hmm. Economics comes from the word ecology. It's talking about the wealth in your ecology and your environment that you have to garner and harness and harvest in order to produce for yourself the kind of capital necessary to provide food, clothing, shelter, safety. Yes. But in order to manage that wealth, you must have a political structure based on communal, collective, cooperative understanding on how to share. But that political structure manages your economic structure. Mm -hmm. But in order for the political structure to manage your economic structure in a manner that's equitable, you must have a culture that's based on your ancestral information and sacred science that can inform and instruct the polity of how to handle the economy. And in order to understand your culture, which involves everything that makes up your life, culture is language, culture is clothes, culture is food, culture right. is dance, culture is music, but above all, culture is the worldview, the ideological, ethical, moral, perspective you have on life. You interpret it with music. You interpret it with drama. You interpret it with dance. You teach it with, with the intellectual institutions. But it's that central idea of what makes the universe and you partners. That's right. what our ancestors left us. That's the core of culture. And at the heart of that core of culture is your notion of divinity the best that you could possibly imagine yourself to be. Right. So when we look at culture, I talk, I talk about that shit, our traditions, our spiritual systems, our art, music, dance, folklore, mythology, cosmology. All of that. Understanding the universe as an orderly system. Cosmogony, yeah. understanding the origins of the universe based upon that particular cultural paradigm, language, educational that. system, et cetera, yes. And then- This is a simple way to look at it, Michael. Okay. You're a son, mm -hmm. and you're giving off wisdom right now. I'm the moon. Mm -hmm. I will reflect that wisdom, which okay. is your life. Okay. Right. We are in orbit as we're learning. And so our family is a constellation. Right. Look at the rules of the constellation and its relationship to one another, and look at the rules of family. Mm -hmm. Look at the rules of father and mother and look at the sun and the moon. There's a reason Isis was called the moon and the reason Asar was called the sun. Mm -hmm. Look at its function. We copied the universe in creating our socialization process and our social order. We emulate and imitated nature, cosmology, and ecology. Right. And it became African culture, ideologically. Right. We implemented through our dance, our music, our language, our folklore, our dress. 
you know. Exactly. You know, uh, Dr. Marimba Ani, who wrote the book Yurugu, an African Centered Critique of European Cultural Thought and Behavior, she talks mm -hmm. about how culture acts as an immune system, which keeps foreign elements from coming in and attacking us. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we look at culture, culture is the glue or cohesiveness that binds a people together and tells them the only way they will survive is also through working together cooperative economics and self-reliance. That doesn't mean that they don't use politics. That doesn't mean that they don't engage in strategic voting, things like this, but it's you understanding. Take, you that. take this with you in those institutions. Right, exactly. You take that this with is, you. This is your coat of armor. This is your dress. This is your uniform. Right. And you take this with you. Right. When, when we think of culture, you know, when we see the Pharaoh, take the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. You got a head of a human being. Mm -hmm. on the body of this gigantic lion sitting in the middle of the friggin' desert by some pyramids. Right. I'm not to go into the detail of what all of this means. Let's just look at the simplest piece. On the top of the head of the, the, the human who's wearing the head cloth of the pyramid, which is of the pharaohs, which is simply covering the sacred locks, which we today call, unfortunately, dreadlocks that everybody wear because we were just inventing the comb and the person who was our spiritual leader always imitated the ancestors and the ancestors had locks before they invented the comb so simplifying stuff take away the mystery by giving them the history then then look at that head there's a snake up there a cobra that's broken off i think it's in the british museum and a vulture well, the vulture symbolizes spiritual knowledge. The cobra symbolizes intellectual knowledge. And what it is saying when the human mind is imbued with the spiritual knowledge of the universe and the intellectual knowledge that derives from it, it gives it mastery over the mighty animal, which is symbolized by the lion. So either you're going to be the beast or you're going to be the God consciousness. And the intellectual and spiritual cultural wisdom of our ancestors raise us as the Sphinx show from the beast level to the God consciousness level. Exactly. Just exactly. one teaching tool the ancestors left for us. Absolutely. We need to learn. Let me ask you this as we uh, wind down here, and um, I, I and also very quickly, uh, for those just tuning in, hey, uh, I'm Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture, and writer. We're speaking with Professor James Small, one of my teachers, brilliant historian. You've seen him in the Hidden Colors documentaries. You've seen him in 1804, The Hidden History of Haiti, both from um, Director Tariq Nasheed. Also, mm -hmm. he and I are both in Elementary Genocide Part 3, from director mm -hmm. Raheem Shabazz out of Atlanta. All right, so we're talking about uh, the legacy of slavery in America, 400 years, 1619 to 2019, but also we started out dealing with the African presence before slavery, the African presence in uh, uh, this land, the yeah. United States of America, yes, before slavery as well. Um, and, and very quickly, uh, I will be in uh, Brooklyn, New York this weekend, uh, Friday, August 23rd at uh, Sister's Place and okay. Saturday, August 24th at the Makana Museum as part of the Black Agenda on tour. Michi X, Jice Johnson, Gade Arendelle, and myself. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com for more information or go to the Black Agenda on Tour.com, the Black Agenda on Tour.com. Uh, let me ask you this question, brother. Uh, two quick questions. One, um, you talk. Uh, you talked about the term African American in the past, and you talked about how Africa is my race, America is my geopolitical place. Okay, uh, talk about that for a minute, because people get confused of African American and say, oh, "I've never been to Africa. I want to be black." But talk about that for a minute. Right, uh, Africa. That's a continent that's named Africa. Mm -hmm. There are ethnic families. I know families and I have friends that I'm close to over here whose family is called the Afriye. So it, our lineage, our historical lineage that proceeds, since we know Africa is the genesis of humanity, when the divinity of the universe manifests itself as a human being, it was an African on the continent of Africa where that, as far as we know scientifically, took place. And so we were brought from Africa. Some of us came on our own centuries before. 
Some migrated by foot when the land bridges were there. Some came by boats. The most recent population, that is the dominant population, was the last layer, which is those who came on the enslaved vessels of the European practicing genocide against us. And we amalgamated with those other Africans who were here and became one people. So Africa is our race, it is our culture, it is our spiritual system, it is our fatherland and our motherland. America is not a race, it's not a culture, and it certainly is not the fatherland of those who run it. America is a geopolitical institution where we work in, we own our property and our homes in, we pay our taxes in, we vote in, and we participate in our social life through sports and dancing and dining and other things. So America is our geopolitical space, while Africa is our race. When I say race, I'm including my culture. I'm including my ancestry. I'm including my spiritual system. I'm including my Genesis story when I talk about my coming into being as a race of people. Black is an adjective that we use to describe ourselves. The truth is the adjective don't really work if we want to be logical because we are all shades of brown. Right. You know, so, you know, hey, we could be the brown people and get away with it, but we can't be the black people and get away with it. You know, right. but we use black to mean a reference back to Africa because that's where the black blue people of Sudan and the black blue people of Chad and the black people of the Upper Nile live, out of which we came. Right. Because you know that we are. When we look at the term African American, people mistakenly think that it was created by Reverend Jesse Jackson, a group of historians nah. in 88, 89. But when we do the research, we see the earliest recorded usage of the term African American goes back to May 15, 1782, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Washington mm -hmm. Post has two articles that talk about this and document this. It's going back to 1782. And also, when we look at the term Afro-American, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't created in the 1960s. We see that going back to the 1830s, the term right. Afro-American. And we see it in organizations like the National Afro-American League, founded about right. the Thomas Fortune. Yeah, well, that's the Afro-American Council 1898. Council 1898. Afro-American Council 1898. National right. Afro-American League, which was the precursor about 1892. We also see mm -hmm. the Afro-American newspaper in Baltimore right. about 1882 or so. Yes. So, so we got to really yeah. study this history. Go, go ahead, Professor Small. Yeah, so what, what the media did, the media, because we in the streets was already calling ourselves African-Americans. Exactly. And, and what they wanted to do was to take control mm -hmm. of the label and the narrative that went with the label and that's when they projected Jesse having used the term. We've been using the term decades before Jesse. Yeah, I know going back to the 60s. I know they were talking about this. They were using that term in the 60s. They didn't even Malcolm. And this, Malcolm. Yes. I was in the streets of the 60s with them. And when I say street, I was in the streets. Right? I was <laughs> in the university. I was like the street uh, gangster historian. You know what I'm saying? Right. The, the brothers called me Triple OG, you know? Right. <laughs> but no, we were already using that term. Mm -hmm. What they did after hearing somebody of Jesse's standard using it, the media went crazy with it because they have always tried to take control of our narrative. Right. And all the way you took control of the narrative was through the label. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they were playing a game on us mm -hmm. while they were glorifying us choosing the new label. African American. Uh, right. They were using the legal documents that define what product we should get that was deriving from our Civil Rights Bill and the other bills we had battled for. They left that label minority and then began to define other people under that label, oh, which meant God. that most people, um, people who had uh, handicaps, white women, mm -hmm. um, other Europeans of certain background, other ethnic people of color, both Asian and Latin and others, sure. who, who, had, who were not enslaved in the United States, mm -hmm. who by the laws of the United States was not entitled to any of those perks mm -hmm. that was won as a part of uh, repairing the damage done to us, will right. now become recipients of those things, which then marginalize the amount of us that would get access to those resources. 
Right. I just had right. to go there because sometimes people miss that. No, you're and correct. I started out as early as 1968 in, a, in an article I wrote. Just like in 1972, I wrote Who's Third in the Third World? And it was always the African American. Everybody else sat around the table, had a label, but they wanted mm -hmm. us to sit there and be neutral. Right, yeah. right. And the largest population involved in the discussion was us at the table. Right. So we didn't have to have a label. So when we talk about the term African American, we see it as a identity, we see it as an ethnic group. Now you'll have some who say, well, it's not a nationality. Okay. How do how do we navigate through that? How do we understand that nuance? In the same way Yoruba is an ethnic group, mm -hmm. Akan is an ethnic group, Haitian is an ethnic group, Jamaican is an ethnic group. How can you accept yourselves in these ethnic categories? Irish is an ethnic group. And when it comes to the African-American, you say, be a blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah, we are the fourth or fifth largest African population in the world. Mm -hmm. Nigeria, Brazil, Ethiopia, right. I think we're the only three larger than we are. You know? Right. And in this population, we've been on the front line battle against white imperialism, white colonialism, and white supremacy from a minority position taking them on on a frontal assault where all the other African populations have been in majority position fighting white supremacy. We've been in minority position tackling white supremacy and we've had some of the greatest victories in the world. Right, exactly. That rewards all of our people around the world. But the, 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 since we were not in control of the narrative explaining our victory, our enemy is often explain our victory as our defeats. Right. And frightened our people and not wanting to partner with us because they felt we were defeated. Right. Right. And that didn't be the father some of the truth. Let me ask you this. We're gonna wrap up here and I want I want you to let people also know how they could get in top contact with you as well. When we when early on we talked about uh the origins of this country, we talked about criminals coming here. It's documented that you know England yes. enters its jails from 1611 to 1783, right? How do we when we understand this chronology of history, how okay. should we and how do you view and interpret and understand white abolitionists who during slavery also risked their lives to help free slaves, end slavery, whatever? How, do, how, how should we view white abolitionists? And I think being the African, we've got to be true to what makes us what we call African. We are the human beings. Right. And we've never rejected anybody, nor have we seek vengeance on those who have committed the worst crime of humanity against us. Mm -hmm. There were many whites who fought with us from the beginning of our time in this country to present. Mm -hmm. There have always been that population. But again, let's decode white, too. Mm -hmm. See, and okay. be careful there, right? Sure. sure. Because Italians just became white last year. Irish just became white the year before. Jews are just becoming white now. So there's all of these populations during the 1600s, 1700s, that didn't know they were white. Mm -hmm. That was treated by the German elite who really are the ones who have pushed the white issue. And the German elite of the European world had marginalized all of these other European colored people, but when they got to America and found themselves in a minority, they had to create a majority, so they pulled into their ranks. Right. The colored peoples of Europe, the, the Greeks, the colored people, the Slavs, the colored people, the Irish, the Scots, the colored people, the Italian, the colored people have been allowed to be honorary whites. Mm -hmm. Make no bones about it, they all know they are honorary. <laughs> they right. know they're honorary. Right. The largest ethnic population in this country is Germans. Mm -hmm. Not whites now. This is Germans. Okay? Right. Separate from the Italian and the Irish and the, and the second largest population in this country, ethnic population, is the African American. Mm -hmm. Those who were enslaved in the United States and who amalgamated with the indigenous population that was already here. That's the second largest population, but nobody breaks it down by ethnicity. It breaks it down by the false race color scheme 
And then you don't see how power gets distributed. Right. Exactly. Where power lies. Exactly. Now you used to teach at uh, it was City College in New York, I think it was. You were a professor. Uh, at, it used to be a professor at City College in New York. City, yes, City College. I was also a professor, but I was an administrator for seventeen years. Okay. I ran a theater for sixteen years. I was the manager of the theater, which is a part of my administrative duty running the student union. Mm-hmm. I ran three cafeterias, so my kids always ate lunch for free. <laughs> you know? Okay. Um, and you taught at City College in New York, also, right? Yeah, City okay. College in New York is the senior college in the city university system. Right. It is the largest. It has an engineering school. It has a medical program. It has a theater program. It has um, science, one of the largest science division in the world. And it's, it's one of the best kept secret white folks got in New York. Okay. Uh, let people know how they can follow you on social media, how they can get in contact with you if they want, if they want to bring you in to do a right. lecture or something like that. How can they get And how can they order your DVDs? Well, your I'll, I'll give them two things. My telephone number mm-hmm. is 914 nine six zero two six nine three and the second is my email a like apple m like man um p like paul o like orange s like sam a like apple the number three at gmail.com i'm punsa three and the telephone number I just took my website down because I'm trying to reinvent myself and I haven't figured out how I'm going to do it yet. But I have to erase it because I want to come back with something completely different on this last part of the journey. Okay. But uh, they can email you to get your, your DVD lectures, all that stuff. Yes, uh, they can email you for that. And you see him in Hidden Colors 5. Uh, you see him in, uh, he's in Hidden Colors uh, 4. Uh, Hidden three, Colors 2. Two, and, yeah, two, and he's in 1804 from all from Tariq Nasheed. He's in Elementary Genocide 3. We're in that together with, along with Professor Kaba Kamene. And don't uh, forget Out of Darkness. Out of, oh, Out of Darkness, yeah, yeah. Because I, I was just with uh, Amadeus Christ a few months ago. Yeah, he's in Out of Darkness as well with Amadeus yeah. Christ, director Amadeus Christ. All right. Well, look, uh, uh, Professor Kaba, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I have Professor Kaba come to That's all right. That's my brother. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'm honored, Brother Michael, and I'm so proud of you and the work that you're doing. Brother. Um, you know, our people, your generation is just gonna take it to the next level. Yeah, we have to, man. It's a continuum. Yeah, happy with that. Yep. Well, look, brother, it's been good talking to you, and I'll yes, talk sir. to you soon. Mod Hotel, good. brother. Okay. Hotel. Right, peace. peace and blessings. Peace, brother. All right, everybody. That's uh, Professor James Small, one of our great scholar warriors, one of my teachers, also. Uh, I'm Michael M. Hotel, host of the African History Network show, founder of the African History Network. Follow us here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, I M H O T E P. Uh, also, we have um, Hidden Colors 5 available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Hidden Colors 5, the uh, art of black warfare, where each copy of Hidden Colors 5 you purchase, you'll get. Uh, three of my digital download presentations free is automatic, so you can download them. The link expires after about 72 hours, but you can download them and keep the my, my, my presentations. Um, it in, one of the presentations you get is called Six Principles of Political Self-Defense. Six Principles of Political Self-Defense. Um, I, I do online classes. We just had one that uh, just started up. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. If you like this discussion here, the one we did with Dr. Leonard Jeffries, the online course that I teach will blow you away. It's an, it's an eight-week 16 hour online course where we deal with thousands of years of history. We deal with understanding the transatlantic slave trade chronologically. We deal with ancient Egypt. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe uh, by the Africans known as the Moors that lead to the transatlantic slave trade happening. And as the conversation we just had with Professor James Small, uh, he agreed with me. When you study the chronology of this history, the transatlantic slave trade is actually European Europeans getting revenge on Africans for what happened for hundreds of years in Europe. And we see Africans intermixing into the European population in Europe, changing the complexion to varying degrees of the European population as well. Okay. 
And so did all this stuff is going to come back to kick us in the behind. So we posted the link here. Uh, you can register for the online course. It's regularly $130. It's on sale $80. Um, as soon as you register, you can watch class number one. So we do the classes live Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again, watch from around the world. There's also about 36 hours of bonus content for you to watch also, okay? We posted the link here. It's, all, it's uh, at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com um, as well, so you can register there, okay? I will be in, uh, where will I be? I'll be in Brooklyn, uh, August 23rd and 24th uh, for the Black Agenda Tour with MeTX, Jice Johnson, Jade Arendelle. Uh, Friday, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., we are at Sister's Place, 456 North Strand Avenue, 456 North Strand Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. And then uh, on Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., we are at the uh, Makata Museum, the Makata Museum. Uh, that is located at, uh, what's the address for the Makata? Um, 80 Hanson Place, Brooklyn, New York, okay? Uh, Friday, it's free. That is for uh, community organizations, things like that. Uh, they have the information at the website, uh, theblackagendaontour.com, theblackagendaontour.com. Uh, we also have the information at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. Saturday. It is uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Makata Museum. Use the promo code Brooklyn. Use the promo code Brooklyn to get $15 off adult tickets. Youth tickets for uh, ages 25 and under are $25. Those are youth tickets. Ages 12 and under are free, okay? And I will be presenting on six principles of political self-defense. Uh, how public policies impact the economic conditions of African Americans. And uh, uh, we, I just interviewed uh, Michi X and Jade Arendelle. Uh, was it Sunday night? All my days are running together. I was at the three day African World Festi Festival. I was a vendor there all three days. That's like 11 a.m., 11 p.m., and I was doing presentations. And I'm, I'm doing four interviews today. We did uh, Dr. Linda Jeffries. Uh, we just finished with Professor Jane Small. Um, in a few minutes, we have Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene coming up. And then around 8 p.m., 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Today, we have Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote the book, uh, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Okay, I just had the book. I've got like three stacks of books and they've all fallen into one stack here on the floor, something like that. So where's this book? Uh, right here. The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep. So we have them coming up 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is all commemorating and understanding the 400th year anniversary of August 20th, 1619 when uh, that English pirate ship, the White Lion, comes into Port Comfort in Virginia. Uh, and even though this did happen, African people have been in this land that we call the United States of America going back tens of thousands of years, at least 51,700 years. So we're gonna get deep into that with Professor Kaba. Uh, Professor Kaba Kamene, you've seen him in the Hidden Colors documentaries in 1804, Out of Darkness, Elementary Genocide 3. And then also with uh, Dr. David M. Hotel, who actually wrote this book. And I talked to him uh, yesterday. So his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited, is coming out, he said, uh, uh, either December or 1st of the year uh, 2020. OK, and it has about he has about a thousand footnotes in the new book, about 200 additional pages It's going going to be deep. All right. So if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Uh, we have we have Hidden Colors 5 also. OK, uh, all of my DVD lectures are at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have bundle packs. But if you want to donate to the African History Network, PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show, PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show, okay? That helps us to keep doing the research, finance our Sunday night show, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation WFDF. And I've been in and out of town and they've been playing Major League Baseball preempting my show, but it helps finance the research, helps us to uh, pay the bills, um, pay when I have to travel, cover expenses, things like that also, okay? PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show, 
or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? Uh, here's the link to one of my latest presentations. I've done, I have six presentations on DVD from this year. This is why Black people switch from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. It's a three-hour presentation I did, and this goes back and deals with the Lily White movement of 1928 to push African Americans out of the Republican Party. Many people don't understand this history. They think it's because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. No, it's not. You got to go back 40 years before that. This is uh, our latest DVD bundle pack, the Black Migrations 6 DVD bundle pack. Uh, includes uh, deals with this year's theme for African American History Month. Includes uh, my six uh, DVD lectures I've done this year so far. The Black Migrations 6 DVD bundle pack, okay? All right, uh, so hopefully you all uh, uh, enjoy this type of information. Uh, how do you all like this type of information? Uh, we know this is a, a very, very important day in our history, but the research and the studying of our history, the honoring of our ancestors continues throughout the year. But we know also this is a very, very important day in our history. A lot of people have been reading the articles uh, from the 1619 Project from uh, the New York Times, or they've been reading articles from the Washington Post, things like that. And even those articles are good. They really don't deal with the African presence in this country going back tens of thousands of years before uh, uh, 1619. And they don't deal with the history of the Africans known as the Moors, okay? All right, so, and then also if you like this type of information, be sure to register for uh, the online uh, course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, all right? Because we deal, we get deep into this information and uh, all the sessions are recorded, they're archived, you can watch them over and over again. As soon as you register, you can watch uh, class number one and there's about 36 hours of bonus content, okay? That new section that I started up, that meets uh, Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, okay? Anything you miss, you can go back and watch over and over again. All right, so look, uh, we're gonna get out of here. I'm gonna rest for a few minutes and then uh, we'll be back with Professor Kabahai Wafa Kamene doing four interviews today, and then I'm going to call it a night. I think I'm going to bed early tonight. This is a long day, but I figure, hey, we waited 400 years for this, so I can, <laughs> I, can make, <laughs> I can make it through the day. All right, Charles, Kim, Anita Kent, uh, Evelyn da and Dallas, Dallas, uh, okay. They like this type of information. All right, guys. Hey, remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.